All right, welcome everybody. We are live on Facebook and we are recording. So I want to thank you all for attending our presentation today from Herta Gruden. We have Kellyanne Mills who's going to join us and present to us some amazing things about Herta Gruden and expedition cruising. So I'm going to turn it right over to you, Kelly. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you everybody for watching our video today. We're super excited to be here. I know that there's a lot of people that might not have heard of us prior to today, but we're so excited that you're here. I am here on behalf of Hurtigruden. My name is Kelly and I look after the Northeast for the company and the Midwest. So I really want to give you guys an opportunity to learn a little bit about what we do and how our trips work. So when I first start to talk about the company, I want to tell you where we started and where we're going. We are an expedition cruise line and we go to some of the most remote destinations on earth and we go to some of the places that you've heard of, but with more of an expedition spin. So when you're looking at expedition cruising, you can do that from whether you are in the Arctic with us in Arctic Svalbard and Greenland and Iceland and Norway, or if you're all the way down south in Antarctica with us, which is the picture that you see on your screen, which is one of our ships in Antarctica, it's really an amazing experience to travel in an expedition fashion. So for those of you who have not previously heard of us, we started out as a cruise line back in 1893. So we've been around for 127 years, which is a pretty decent amount of time for a cruise line. But we started out up in the Arctic and what we started doing for all of our people up there was what we called the sports route back then. So Arctic Norway, if you guys are very familiar with the country, it was have some really difficult to navigate icy waters in the winter. But back then there wasn't a lot of ways to get around. You know, the people couldn't get up and down the coast to deliver goods. So we actually started as a cargo line and we used to bring the goods and the mail and all that other fun stuff up and down the coast. And then we grew and grew and grew. And now we have, you know, morphed into an expedition line. We've been in Svalbard since 1897. We've been, we are the largest operator in Antarctica. So we really want to give you, you know, an idea of what the history was for us. And that original coastal voyage I was talking about is still in operation to this day. So you can see how close in you're getting to see the beautiful fjords of Norway. So if it's something you're interested in, you definitely want to come with us. But I'm going to talk a little bit about why come with us. So we are one of the industry leaders in sustainability. I'm going to show you a couple of slides on that as well. But you want to come with us because of the pioneering expertise that we have. So having done this in the Arctic icy waters for 127 years, you are with ship captains who can navigate all of these difficult waters who you are safe and comfortable with. In addition to having beautiful new ships that have the comfort and the sustainability that you're looking for. So we still refer to ours as a base camp at sea because we are not a high formality luxury line. So there's no suits and ties. You are not gonna have to get dressed up for a formal night with us. But as you can see, as we go on some pictures of what the ships look like, you're going to have those comfort levels and you know those luxury levels that you're used to with hot tubs and infinity pool and beautiful pointed cabins, but not the formal atmosphere. So you don't wanna go out all day long you know, be trekking around in Antarctica and then come back and have to get dressed up. You want to enjoy the Arctic how it should be, how I'm dressed, how you, how in a polar sweater or in, you know, your gear and just relaxing. One of the commitments we have to the environment is our green technology. And I always talk about that first because we did start the world's first hybrid powered cruise ships which have the ability to operate both on battery power and on the liquid natural gas instead of the heavy diesel fuels. So we do, we are proud of that technology. We have our smaller vessels, we have electric snowmobiles and Svalbard. So we do make sure that we are trying to be as innovative and at the forefront of the technology as possible. Our guests and our crew participate in cleaning beaches and making sure the places that we're going are you know, taken care of. We have these initiatives because we want everyone to see that even though there are no people living up in that area of Svalbard, the plastics may be getting there and what we can do to help. 
we were the first to go a single use plastic free ban, which means we don't have bottled waters on our ships. We have a reusable water bottle and filling stations. We don't use single use plastics there just to make sure that we are not contributing to the issues. And our environmental partnerships, you know, we are on the founding members of AECO. We are part of IATO, which is the Antarctic Association of Tour Operators. And we are all in for every single thing that they offer. So if we're over there trying to help navigate what kind of regulations there are, making sure we, along with everyone else, are participating and keeping up to date with them. We have our Hurtigruten Foundation, which we opened in 2015, which really does try to work its best to make sure that it's there for everyone who needs it. So it's not just one person. You can go online and research it. You can be from anywhere if you wanted to apply for a grant twice a year. In addition to that, besides building schools and doing in Greenland and helping people learn the right things, we've trained the dogs in Svalbard. So we've had a couple of different options as to what we've done with the foundation. So you can read all about that on the website. And we also aid in the scientific research. We have citizen science projects that go on on board and I'll show you more about that as well. So a lot of the places we sail are not well-traveled. So we're there and able to help with the research. We try to make sure we're maintaining a minimal impact on the environment and so also supporting the communities that we enter. So if we're up in Greenland, we wanna support the people that are there. If we are on the local coast of Norway, we're so locally sourcing the food and making sure we're supporting the community there. So we are always looking to support. For our world's first hybrid powered ships, I just wanted to throw this slide up. I kind of like the way it does show you how a little bit that it works and why it's so important and the size of the battery packs that are on board. We're able to sail emission free when we are using those battery packs and it also reduces overall emissions by 20%. So when you're in these pristine waters, you want to make sure that you're operating the right way. We are super proud of the plastic free future. We want to be a part of that. So obviously, again, making us sure that we were the first to go single use plastic free. And you know what, we're super excited when we see other lines doing the same thing. So it's not about competition. It's about leading the way and about being able to pioneer these ideas that we're hoping everybody is going to take notice of and participate in. We have introduced biogas powered cruise ships, which are fueling with the remnants of the fishing industry. So what we're taking out of the water is what we're putting back in and not using heavy chemicals. And all of these things are stuff you can research if your agent that you're working with wants to grab you a brochure so you could read more about it. It's great, but not compromising the comfort level and what your expectations should be of the ship. So here's the inside of the rolled Amundsen and the Fritschtoff Nansen. I just picked a couple of pictures to choose from. So whether it's the cabins, which are all beautifully done, you know, true Scandinavian decor, not having, you know, a crystal staircase or the largest water slide at sea, but we do have the largest LED screen at sea. You know, it's going to span seven decks high outside your glass elevator so you can still see nature projected onto the screen. We have tons of videos that your agents can send you so you guys can learn. And of course, the entertainment. Our entertainment on board is really our expedition team. They are your hosts. They're your guides. They are your lecturers. They're going to be out there digging your way to make sure you're in safe hands when you're doing landings. They're going to be helping you on and off the Zodiacs. They're going to be out. You can dine with members of the expedition team should you choose to. They're in the science center. So they are really all over board the ship. And they're wonderful people to talk to because they're going to enhance your experience. When you have over 350 team members worldwide, they come from all different countries. It is not just one specific place. And they're educated in both their field and everybody is certified and trained in polar survival. So you know that you're with someone who understands the Arctic, who's been there or the Antarctic, wherever it is you're traveling with us. And you also are gonna be hearing from them 
on their specialty. So if you're out in the morning and you're out there to catch that marine bird life that's out there, an ornithologist is gonna be taking pictures and helping you learn about what you're seeing. Same thing with rock formations. Up in Eastern Canada, it might be a geologist that's standing there talking about what those monoliths are and why you're going to go trek to see them. Or it could be a, a glaciologist that's teaching you about the ice blocks in Antarctica. So they really do enhance your experience. When you go somewhere and you learn about what you're doing while you're doing it, you feel like you understand the destination and you don't feel like you missed something, which is super important for me when I travel. You know, I always think the same thing. You know, I wanna understand where I am. I wanna learn, but then I wanna have that experience and step off and do what I just saw. And it's a great way to enhance what you're used to and how your expectations are when traveling. We try to make sure you have all your gear. That's me in the top right with my blonde long hair that I used to have um, up in one of our Zodiacs up in Eastern Canada. And another picture on the top is an example of our Zodiacs. What you would be sitting in when you're going ice cruising or it might be that you're anchored and that that's what you're gonna be taking ashore. And we wanna make sure you have everything you need for adventure. So use of our muck boots on board so that you have the right footwear and you don't have to lug it clear across the world with you. Same thing with our headlamps, our hiking poles, everything that we feel you need, always ask. In addition, we give you a what to pack idea for your clothing as well. So as you can see on there, we don't have single use plastic. So we will give you a reusable water bottle for the filling stations. And we will give you as a gift the water bottle and the jacket are yours to keep as a gift for coming with us. The jacket is a Helly Hansen shell. It is not a lined parka because the weather changes everywhere you go. It might be 33 degrees in the morning and 55 in the afternoon and back down to 25 at night. So you want to make sure you're layered properly, but you have a solid wind and water resistant layer on top. So that's what we provide for our guests. And again, you're always going to make sure you ask your travel advisor when booking what you should be bringing and they'll always be happy to help you. Your camera equipment for some of these absolutely stunning gorgeous shots and you're ready to go. For the culinary experience, we do have the capability to cater to all different diets. So if you are vegan, if you are looking for something specific, our chefs are more than equipped to accommodate you. You would just let them know when you're there and they can help to accommodate. With meals, you're gonna have breakfast, you're gonna have lunch, you're gonna have dinner. There's an early morning, ri early riser, break like continental breakfast for those who are doing the yoga or the mile around the ship. An afternoon treat, you're always gonna have outdoor barbecues if the weather permits and we can do them. So we try to make sure we give a variety of different types of food, a mixture of buffet and um, sit down dining. Now we know right now with COVID they're not doing buffets, but hopefully in the future when everything starts to come back to normal, which we are all fingers crossed, we could go back to the way we do obviously do things. Your house wine and your beer are included with your lunch and your dinner, your soda, your mineral water, and then your coffee and tea and water is available all day long for you. We are a gratuities not expected cruise line. So you are not expected to leave a certain amount per person per day. It is not required. Should you choose to leave something for the crew, you are welcome to do that. And they will explain to you on board how, but we don't ask you and tell you it's mandatory on our cruise line at all. Expedition takes priority over meal times. You're gonna see that a lot of the places you're going to, you're going for different reasons. And one of them might be for the wildlife. And if you're getting ready to have dinner, like I was one night where the sunset was absolutely gorgeous. The whales came out, we all got up and went right on deck to take pictures. We came back, we post, and it basically took up an extra half hour than we should have. And of course you hear them come over the loudspeaker and say, okay, everyone on second dining, it got pushed back a half hour because the first dining got up and left and was outside with you taking the wonderful pictures. So there could be, you know, we could be following the whales, anything could be happening. So you always want to make sure you have a flexible state of mind, not necessarily a physical flexibility, more so of a mental flexibility. So your onboard engagement, again, you are in the science centers. Here's a pictures of what they look like on the bottom. We have one of our expedition team members giving a lecture in our lecture hall. 
up top, you're in the center of the science center. You have your microscopes. You might be studying things. You might be learning. You might be taking in a lecture. You might be working with one of the expedition team. But in addition to that, we have our citizen science programs as well. You always have an introductory photo lecture and Wi-Fi is included in all your sailings as well. And in addition to that, you're in some remote places. So the Wi-Fi might not always work perfectly, but it is incorporated, it is included in your package. So you never have to worry about paying for something that might not work every second of the day. We do have a Young Explorers at Sea program. So we recommend ages five and up for Antarctica. That is a mandatory. And for the remaining of our cruises, we don't have an age limit, but we don't have a kids club or babysitting services. But what we do have for the Young Explorers program, which is kind of cool, they get their own science manual. The expedition team is gonna pay very special attention to them. So if you are traveling as a multi-generational family, Everyone will have something to do and they might even get a chance to go out with the expedition team without their parents to set the flags and get everything ready. So we do try to take care of our young explorers, even though we don't have your typical babysitting services that other lines might have. Here's an example of one of our citizen science projects, which is the science boat, which you can sign up for when you get on board. And if you're interested in going out with the scientists on board that are researching, you can go out to see what they're studying with them. Here's a picture on the left where they were studying some Antarctic krill and they were pulling them out of the water or it might be, you know, making the drone recordings. It might be going the underwater drones. It might be where they're studying something specific depending on the destination that you're in. So it's a really nice opportunity to participate in a lot of these programs. So when I talk about landings and ice cruisings, there might be some of you that are thinking, what does a landing mean? Or what do you do when you go ice cruising? Or why is this exciting? And I wanted to give you a better explanation of what that is. So with expedition, people get nervous, right? You think, oh no, I can't do this. Our adventure and expedition are not for me. I might not be physically able. And I'm here to tell you that most likely you are physically able because it's really more of a mental flexible state than severely physically needing. So you have options. You can be as active or as not active as you want to on a trip with us. So if you look at the bottom picture, this is a penguin colony. And as time goes on in Antarctica, you know, you'll see the pink colored snow beneath the penguins, which is, you know, something that happens after they're, you know, busy doing their business for a few months. But when you look at where that zodiac pulls up to, you are right in the center of the action. So you don't have to do a 23 mile hike to see the penguins. They're right there. And we're going to make sure that you're comfortable and you're able to do that. So if you can climb in and out of a bathtub, you can climb in and out of a zodiac. And I'll show you even further on our, our picture. The top picture is ice cruising and how really small we are compared to some of these unbelievable icebergs that you're going to see. And Honestly, if you can sit and relax and enjoy a ride, you can go ice cruising. So on your screen, here's how you're going to launch out of our ships, no matter where you are. The expedition launch is always at sea level. So you can see from the platform, you'll be able to just climb right in and out of that Zodiac. The members of the expedition team and the operations crew are always there with a helping hand to help pull you on and off. But as you can see from the picture on the right, you're stepping right across. So it's not going to be where you have to, you know, dive off the side of a plank and jump into a thing. It's not like that. You can climb in and out and you're easily able to get by. Here's a picture my colleague took from her Zodiac when we were when right in front of you. And you can see how close to the water level and how simple it is just from where they're standing and getting on and off the ship. And then when you get to land, so now you're in the Zodiac, how do you land? We have three different types of landing. So you're either gonna be on a dry landing and you can see here from the picture, it's how you're gonna be able to pull right up to a dry dock. This is a reach, or this is actually a research center that you might be going to visit as one of your stops somewhere. And you can go on and off easily and get it's dry. Then you have a wet landing where the expedition team will be out there in their yellow outfits. That's the expedition team. And they're pulling that Zodiac right up. So you might just have to, your muck boots on and get a little bit wet but you won't have to physically be wet because they will keep you protected when you're climbing in and out. They also have a small set of um, the kind of like those little step stools that they bring out so you could walk out easier. 
And I like this picture because it'll show you just how close you are to the ship. So it's not that you have to take tons of time to get where you're going on a lot of these stops. Some of them might be, you know, a five minute boat ride, a 10 minute boat ride, but here you're right there. So it's much closer up and able to do. And then there's the polar landings. Polar landings, or I call them snow landings, is where the expedition team is going to go out ahead by themselves. They're going to find a spot where they find it safe to dig out a set of stairs for you so that you can actually climb onto the staircase and walk up the stairs to land onto the land. So that would be your polar landing. Those are done obviously in the north in the Arctic and in the south. And once we clean up and leave for the day, it's quite cute. Penguins are quite inquisitive down in the south and they'll watch us taking our you know, guests up and down. We don't interrupt them obviously, no matter how close they get to us. And at the end of the day where we left, there's been occasions where we've seen them actually using the stairs themselves to get on and off. So it's quite nice. And then we always will put everyone in groups. So you'll always know what group you're in. You'll get ready to land, you'll be on, you'll be off, and then you'll go with that group together. We make sure we have enough gear for everyone brought on and then we bring it back with us to the ship at the end, but you guys won't do that. The expedition team will do that for you. And some pictures of what you'll see. I mean, the ice cruising will start out in Antarctica and then you can see pictures of how close the wildlife could really get to you. So you could be there to have that experience. This picture was from the Zodiac behind them and the whales will come and see they're not afraid so they will come to see what you're doing. Another picture of a gorgeous ice cruising. Again, more different scenery. And then if you decide and you are brave, you can do a polar plunge. We do them in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. So you will get a certificate. This is my colleague. They could see her where they're dumping the ice water on her as a ritual. And on the top, that's her in the Arctic waters of Antarctica. And you will get a, a certificate if you choose to. Now, not everyone has to do this, but if you are into having that experience, you definitely can have an Antarctic or Arctic polar plunge certificate. So here's an example of how far south we've gotten. So all the other little tiny gray arrows are different ships with different lines. And the ship captain said, should we go as far south? And the guest said, yes. And that was us, as you can see us all the way on the bottom below the Antarctic Circle. And we actually pulled up to the end of where we could. And you can see the icebreaker with the ice surrounding it. It's just an unbelievable picture. And just an example of some of the, un it's, it's like traveling to the end of the earth and just watching it. It's unbelievable for you to do. Some things that are optional, you can decide to go snowshoeing, like I said, if you didn't want to, and you just wanted to hang out and relax. But for those of you that might be a little more adventurous, if you wanted to go for the snowshoeing, you can. If you wanted to go out and kayak, whether you're in the Arctic or the Antarctic or Norway or anywhere with us, you can. If you decided to overnight camp in the continent of Antarctica, so the ship will actually pull away and you will be there and it will be just that team. So it will be the expedition team and the guests that choose to go and it's two to a tent. It is not glamping in any way, shape or form. It's camping, but you can say, I camped out overnight on the continent of Antarctica and it's something there for you to do. Up in the Arctic, if you're looking for the Northern Lights, you can actually go snowmobiling with us to find them. It's one of the excursions that we offer. You can, in addition to that, go dog sledding up in the Arctic. And these are all the things I participated in last December when we were going and it's unbelievably fun. This is a picture and it's a moving picture of the Northern Lights. And this is something that everyone hunts and is looking to see. And then you have another picture of a still shot of them. So if the Northern Lights are on your bucket list, you wanna come with us from November to March to Arctic Norway. We do have expedition Norway trips that hunt that go up at that time. And we're so confident you'll see them with us that we have a Northern Lights guarantee that says, if you come with us on our 12 day or longer sailings up in the Arctic and up in Norway, and you don't see the Northern Lights, we'll give you a free cruise to come back and do it again. That's how much we know that we're ready to support all of our guests in really finding what they're looking for. So I know I only had a half hour, so I tried to kind of give you a gist of what my cruise line is all about and the way that we try to, you know, 
have you join us for that experience. I hope it was interesting for you. And Nora, I'm going to come to you and ask if we have any Q and A, because I know we have a couple of minutes left. Yeah, I don't see anything in the chat or the Q and A now, but please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we'll stay on for a couple of minutes. Kelly Ann, this was amazing. The pictures were awesome and it got me really excited about seeing both the Arctic and the Antarctic. the Antarctic. And you know what, some of these pictures just don't even do it justice. When you're there, it's so different. We we went up in Arctic Norway and we were we went to snowmobiling out to go um, king crab fishing in a frozen fjord and it was December. It was one o'clock in the afternoon, it was dark outside. And it was just unbelievable to just be out there and you know, have this experience that I was able to come home and say I did. And now I'm lucky I work here, but I was able to come home and the guests that were with us, we came home. And when I was talking, everybody was like, wait, why weren't we on this trip? You know, it's, it's just an exciting thing to be able to do. And I'm so excited for anyone that's willing to come and share it with us. There is one question uh, about that 12 day cruise yes. uh, that you just talked about in, in Norway. So give, give us an idea. What, what does that cost uh, for, for someone. Sure. So you can leave out of Dover or out of Hamburg if you wanted to leave out of Germany, but most of us will leave out of Dover or out of the UK. It is anywhere from a 12 to a 15 day because we do have multiple itineraries to choose from. So some will leave from Dover and go all the way up to Honingsvag, which is the end, like, which is the northernmost town in the world. And they will have, you know, come back down you're going to spend the majority of your time on our Arctic winter sailings above the Arctic Circle. So, and there will be a ceremony for you when you go across the Arctic Circle and you get a certificate for that too, by the way. But when you come up there, you're going to have the option to go to these little tiny towns, the Lofoten Islands in Norway and Alta, which is the Norway's well, it's really the world's Northern Lights capital. The Northern Lights Cathedral is there. And anytime that you have a clear night, that's where they're going to come out. You're going to stop in 12 different ports and you're going to be able to see all different types of things, whether it's a Viking museum, whether it's a Polar Lights Cathedral, whether you wanted to go out dog sledding in Trumso or, you know, stopping at the snow hotel on an excursion. So there's really an unbelievable amount of different things you're going to be doing. And then you're going to come back at night. You might enjoy some time in the hot tub. You might go to the wellness center for a nice massage. You might go into the heated infinity pools that some of these ships have, depending on what one you're on. So they have different ships with different models and super comfortable. You relax, you have a lecture after dinner. You might go to the briefing as to what you're gonna do the next day. To be honest with you, by 1030 at night, we were exhausted and ready to go to bed to get up for the following day. So it was an unbelievable experience. And to be honest with you, if you guys, anytime you need me, any of your travel advisors through, you know, Nora can have them set you up with, you can get one of us on the phone. We're happy to help you. They have access to us all the time as well. As a travel advisor, it's one of the advantages. So just make sure that you guys call in and ask. We're always happy to give you more info. Do you have like a lead in price? for that 12 day cruise? Um, they depend when they're on special. Sometimes they might range anywhere from, you know, 4,900 a person with all of your excursions and all of your drinks and meals and everything included, unless you wanna go into one of our suites which have private fireplaces and balconies mm -hmm. and then you're gonna be a little bit higher than that. All right. The sweet guests do pay a primary, but it's, unbelievably worth it when you're sitting on your balcony just enjoying the unbelievable like in Antarctica sitting on a balcony like wow I just woke up and look what I'm looking at so that's awesome another yeah. guest just wanted to make sure she heard it correctly so the northern lights guarantee if if you don't see northern lights you get another cruise you Is get a free true? trip to come back with us and do it again so as long as you're booking within the northern lights season Yes. So it's between November and February, and then you will get a free cruise to come back if they do not come out. Now, if they come out and the captain's blowing the horn and you don't come out to see them, that doesn't count. So you can't say, oh, I didn't see it. I want another cruise. Cause if we could, I would do that every day, but you will get a chance and believe me it does. And you know what, when you're seeing them from the ship, especially 
it's different because you're not in town, right? You're looking at it from outside of town. So we even have some photographs like from outside of a little town called Svolver where it's this beautiful little town and then the Northern Lights are above it. So it's just, it's it's quite awesome. extravagant. When when do you see the Northern Lights? Um, you know, can you, can you clarify like what time of year those yeah. happen? So the most common time is when it's dark, especially up north. So you're going to be looking at their winter, our winter. So November to February. Okay. It can sometimes see them in the summer if you get a dark night, but a lot of times you're in the midnight sun up there, which means that you don't, the sun technically doesn't really set. It just comes down and kind of skates the, which by the way, is another really cool thing to see, especially if you're a golfer and you can, you know, be out there but you can, it can come down and come back up. So it never really gets dark. So the lights don't come out when it's light out. So it has to be dark to see them. Sounds so good. there are some occasions where people will see them in like in Iceland or in, in Northern Greenland in the summer, once in a blue moon, but it wouldn't be the guarantee you would get like you would in Norway. And in Got it. now what about the ship? Do they have like a helipad in case of a medical emergency? We do not have, well, we do have, so it depends on where you are, obviously, in the world. In Antarctica, if there's a medical emergency, and by the way, travel insurance is a must when you're in Antarctica, I would 100% recommend that you have it. I don't even know of anyone who wouldn't go without it. Um, but to get airlifted from Antarctica, you would have to have the Chilean government come in and do that. And in addition to that, it's so there would be a medical clearance form that you would fill out for an Antarctica trip. It's the only trip we have that requires the medical clearance form. So you would have to be medically cleared by your physician to come and do that. It's usually mostly, I would say heart related questions, but I don't know for sure on that form, but you definitely want to make sure you're looking at that when booking the trip, because it is the most remote place and it is really difficult to get back from. It does take a two day sailing to cross the Drake Passage and get back via water. So it would be the Chilean government would fly out and come pick you up. But I mean, knock on wood, we haven't had too many of those, but it's there should you need it. And so when the ships are in say Norway or, or, or Canada and the Arctic, um, does it have a helipad or would they go to the closest Porch. They would just land right, they would be right on land. So when you're in somewhere like Norway, you're up and down the coast. So you're always able to get to a hospital very quickly. Something like Arctic Canada, we would pull alongside and they would land on ground. We would never have them land on the actual ship because that would be a little bit more of a, you know, if you have to be airlifted off the ship, that would be something different. That's where they take the, the helicopter would actually bring the, the stretcher and everything down and airlift you up into the helicopter. If they were doing it on the ship, the helicopter would never land physically on board the ship because that would endanger the other guests, but we would make sure that sure. you are able to do that for sure. There's another question about the, the coastal voyages out of Bergen and going yep. up the coast of, coast of Norway, which is a different product uh, sure. option. Yes, we do have that still. So the original coastal route that I spoke about, which goes from Bergen to Kirkenes to the, to the Russian border and back that those are still original working class ships. When I say original, I don't mean the ones from the fifties are still the ones we're operating. They are much updated, but they are, they stop in 34 ports each way. Some of the ports might only be 15 minutes to drop off mail or cargo. Some of the ports might be a little bit longer and they don't participate in the expedition side because that's not an expedition product. So it wouldn't be the same inclusion. So you always want to double check with your advisor what's included. Those will give you breakfast, lunch and dinner and Wi-Fi in your package, but your beer and wine and excursions are all not incorporated on that product. So you will be in those tiny fjords, you will go up and down the coast, you'll be an authentic experience. You get to be with the local culture, local food, local everything, but they don't have the, you know, you're not gonna have the same amenities and the cabin styles are a little bit different as well. There's very few balconies on those ships. And again, you just have to make sure that you know exactly what you're doing. We don't have full expedition teams. We only have three expedition team members on those ships. So there will still be a lecture series, but it'll just be a little bit different than the other products. Those, that product, we do still have seven ships that run up and down the coast and they do still uh, operate as working class ships. 
Can you tell us a little bit about your security measures due to COVID-19? Um, how, are, how are things gonna be as far as masks, social distancing? Absolutely. So we are in the process of constantly changing the protocols that we put in place. Um, they change basically uh, practically weekly with the requirements from everybody. Um, we do have five, actually we have seven ships running up and down the coast of Norway right now. I believe maybe five are in operation and two are coming, but that is only for the coastal route doing the passenger ferries. It is not for the cruise product for international guests. So we are using that, however, because it's the local transportation to kind of get a little bit of a feel as to what we should and shouldn't be doing. So it's almost like a practice run for the local with the local people and, you know, companies on board. But as of right now, we are looking at mask mandates. We are looking at testing. We are looking at quite a bit of things. We are not set to launch back until May with the expedition product. So everything up until May has not been sailing on expedition. So we don't have anything to say, yes, we're definitely doing this right now because we're not sailing. So, but we are anticipating that it's going to be looking like masks and testing. And, you know, we are our ships operate at a lower capacity than they can have due to the destinations we go to. So even so the ships might hold 530 passengers, we only sail with under 500 and we're not sailing 100% full. So with the amount of less people on board, the social distancing becomes much easier. You can kind of be in your own little bubble with your family or your, you know, whoever you're traveling with, but you know, it's not going to be quite as extensive and a lot of the places we go to some of them don't even have people you know you're going to antarctica you're seeing you know penguins there are no people there or in other certain areas of svalbard in greenland when you're going through the ice so it's mainly just us in some of those destinations which makes it even easier believe it or not to socially distance when you're not visiting anybody and you're visiting the wildlife and and being there ought to get away from maybe the mass amount of people none of our ships operate with more than 500 passengers so, and some of our ships are smaller with 180 or 200. So it's going to depend on the vessel that you're on and what you're, and the destination you're going to, some of it may change, but we do update that, it every month. So keep an eye on it. That is a question that just came in. You know, there are different size ships going up the coast of Norway. Yep. Is there an advantage to going on a smaller ship? No, I wouldn't think so. I think they're all really well put together for the amount of people that they have so and it is and we do have to save a portion of our you know cabins for the local passengers who hop on and hop off so we don't technically really operate at 100 percent anyway so it's you don't really have a benefit to a smaller versus a larger ship on the coast of norway for sure um, other destinations, we do use the smaller ones in areas we have to, like Svalbard, we have the smaller ship that goes. You'll get a smaller ship in certain areas of Iceland, so you'll be able to see which ones are going to be a better fit for you. It's really just traveler preference. Great. Well, thank you to all of our participants. You came up with some great yeah. questions here. For sure. and, and Kelly, you did a wonderful job. Um, I, I believe we've answered everyone's questions, but if you have more, uh, my email is right on the registration um, link that you've got for this. So feel free to send me an email. I'll be happy to get you in touch with your travel advisor and um, or, or a specialist, and they can uh, reach out to Kelly and get you all the answers that you need to be able to make your decisions. So thanks everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone.